Hello everyone in the multiverse and beyond. Today on the show, we have a very special video that was commissioned by a friend forever named Gregory. That's right, you. That's right, you, 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 you. You out there in internet land. You can contact me and we can discuss commissioning me to make a specific video about a specific topic for everyone out there in internet land. That's right, you can commission your friend Forever Evan LaFever to make a video. And this video was commissioned by our friend Forever Greg. So what is this video about? Well, our friend Gregory just so happens to be working on a tremendous art project. And his art project involves combining three topics that at first glance you wouldn't really find to be interconnected in any logical way. But nonetheless, he is making this art project and he commissioned me to make this video today covering all three of these very diverse topics for all of you so what are the topics of the videos well we've got alice in wonderland shark movies and atari video games from the 80s and 70s that's right classic atari games Shark Movies, and Alice in Wonderland. And if you're ready to hear the Evanism truth about Alice in Wonderland once and for all, stay tuned because it's going to blow your fucking minds. So thank Gregory for this video, everyone. And let's get on with it. Kids these days with their PlayStation 7s and their Xbox Series XXX. They don't know what it was like to grow up with the Atari. I grew up with the Atari. When I played a video game, I had to look at little squares on the screen. Little one colored squares. And when I heard sounds on my games, I heard bleep, bloop, bleep, boop, that was what we had. That's right. Hey, I don't mean to sound like an old grandpa, but yes, I myself, even though Nintendo Entertainment System was my first console I ever owned. I started out playing Nintendo and Atari. I had an Atari too. I grabbed one at the... I was lucky enough when I was a youngster to be able to go to the thrift store, walk in and maybe see an Atari or a case of Atari games and be able to pick it up for just a couple bucks. And, but, I mean, look, Atari, if you, if, even, if you grew, even if you grew up with Nintendo... The Atari 2600 seemed a bit archaic. After you've played Zelda and Mario Brothers, it's hard to go back. It's hard to go back to Atari. But for a lot of people, before the Nintendo Entertainment System ever existed, a lot of people got their first experiences with at-home interactive entertainment with the Atari 2600. And at the time, it was nothing other than Atari 2600 for people to compare these graphics to. This was the pinnacle. This was the peak of what people had seen as far as video game machines they could hook up to their TV. So the Atari 2600 capitalized by porting every arcade game known to man to the Atari 2600 different degrees of success some people will say pac-man on a twar atari 2600 is not a good game i thought it was great i thought it was fucking fun i had good times with it um 
There's Adventure. Ooh, remember Adventure? Now Adventure. That's a good original game. Because Atari 2600, you know, yeah, they had a lot of ports. There were a lot of fucking ports from arcade games directly to the 2600, which made it a great system. But they also had a lot of great original games, right? So what were some of the great original games? Pitfall, Pitfall 2, Jungle Hunt. Oh, God, what else was there? Kaboom. Ooh. Ooh, cool. Now the cool thing about the Atari 2600 is they had the joystick controllers and they had the paddle controllers. So they had certain games that you had to switch the controller out and you'd have the paddle controllers and you'd have to like move it around, move the little circle around and it would move the thing like playing Breakout. Oh, Breakout, what a game. You bounce the little ball around and it goes through the bricks and it gets faster as it bounces. Oh, man. Talk about a great game. And like I said, I mentioned Kaboom earlier. You play as this... There's a there's a dude on the top of the screen that's on top of a building and he's got bombs. He's like the bomb dude. He's dropping bombs everywhere and you're on the bottom. You're this dude, you got a bucket of water trying to catch all the bombs and def put out their fuses in the water as they're falling down and use the paddle controller to go back and forth and back and forth and oh, this is so fucking good and I mean there's space invaders, asteroids, defender, joust even basic programming you can do some fucking programming on this thing there was a lot of cool games and like yeah Pitfall was pretty fucking revolutionary I think it got to a lot of things before Mario did you know I think Pitfall Deserves a lot of credit. As a matter of fact, I want Pitfall to come back. God damn it. I want more Pitfall games. We'll see about how we can make that happen. So, the moral of the story is, you know, kids these days with their PlayStation 5s and their Xbox X series, they'll look back at Atari and they'll laugh at it. As a matter of fact, you know, I'd be hard-pressed to find a youngster these days who would probably thoroughly enjoy Atari. Maybe I'm wrong. I would love to be proven wrong, of course, on this matter. But even at the time, even at the time compared to Nintendo games, the Atari games seemed archaic. And, but, there's something about the simplicity. The simplicity of the gameplay, the simplicity of the controls, the simplicity of the graphics that, that forced game designers of the time to really use their imaginations because they couldn't use the graphics to do much but they could find fun ways to do multiplayer believe me there was multiplayer i believe there were a lot of ataris out of four player ports so you could play uh, four players and yeah and yeah sure gaming wasn't in its evolved form at that time We've made so many strides since then, but there's something in the DNA of today's best games that really started and formulated itself in the womb of the Atari 2600 in its games. And that is why the Atari 2600, it's worth trying. You've got to try the Atari 2600, and they're not that expensive. It's, it's still pretty common. There's ways get it i'm sure there's remake consoles out there where you can like you know like the nintendo mini but it's an atari and the little controllers and shit so there's ways there's ways to experience these classic games and i i implore you to there's games like texas chainsaw massacre now that's a crazy game you actually play as leatherface and chase people around with a chainsaw totally crazy They've got, they made one on Halloween. Uh, they made a Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters, which was originally came out on Atari. Oh my God. One of the worst games ever. And of course, speaking of the worst games ever, you can't talk about Atari without mentioning E.T. The infamous E.T. Now, there have been a lot of movies, games on Atari, like Raiders of the Lost Ark, and they were pretty fucking confusing, too. 
why Raiders of the Lost Ark is right up there with E.T. in terms of being a confusing mess. Right? But E.T. takes all the blame. They crucified the fucking game and blamed the, the whole market crash of the 80s on E.T. They, they even went as far as to take all the unsold copies of E.T. and all these other Atari games but it was mostly copies of E.T. and they actually buried them in a landfill. Um, and there's, you know, the angry video game nerd movie was all about this true story. And there's been documentaries on this true story about the Atari landfill and the video game crash. But yeah, so basically people thought that E.T. for Atari 2600 was going to be the greatest game ever and it was skyrocket Atari into the stratosphere because the movie was so successful. What actually ended up happening was the game was so confusing that kids got this game for Christmas and they didn't know how to play it. They couldn't play it. They had no fun with it. And it was just too complex for the time. And there wasn't really a way. I mean, in Atari, you couldn't put text on screen. You couldn't give tutorials. You didn't have any voiceovers. All you had was the player just started controlling things and pushing buttons. If you had any kind of sophisticated menu system or any kind of sophisticated anything, it was really hard for normal people or kids to wrap their heads around. So this resulted in tons of copies of E.T. and even Atari 2600 consoles themselves being returned to the stores and it caused this big video game crash and this, it, so the stores lost consumer confidence in video games and they actually pulled video games from their shelves they stopped selling video games and this isn't a video about Nintendo but Nintendo when they released the Nintendo Entertainment System they didn't even call it a video game system because they couldn't they wouldn't be able to sell it in any toy stores if they called it a video game system. So they actually called it the Nintendo... Yeah, they call it the Nintendo Entertainment System. The Nintendo console, entertainment console. And it came with a robot, Rob the Robot. And they sold it as a toy. An electronic toy. They didn't sell it as a video game console initially. And that is how they got their way got video games that's how Nintendo single-handedly got video games back into the stores and the toy stores after the Atari market crash but Atari signifies a whole era of video games that you can't disregard because without it there wouldn't be a PlayStation 5 without it there wouldn't be an Xbox Series X and beyond so if you call, consider yourself a gamer, I challenge you to go back and at least look at videos of old Atari games, but watching them is just... Is, you actually have to have the controller in your hands. Play these old games. Give it a try. Track a console down. And have some fun with some Atari, because Atari is actually really cool. And there's a lot of gems. A lot of gems on that system. And no, they're not complex. No, they're not the greatest games of all time, but hey, for a lot of people, it brought them a lot of joy because it was the best of the, of the best at the time. It was the industry standard at the time. So, hey, Atari, we love you and rest in peace, Atari. Atari got purchased and repurchased and sold and this and that, new management here and there and split off into different companies multiple times in its journey since the 2600. But, and we all know the Atari Jaguar, the, their last console they tried to make, the 64-bit Atari Jaguar. This is about the 2600, the retro games, the even had Mario Brothers on Atari. Did you know that? The original Mario Brothers is on Atari, as well as Donkey Kong. That's right, Nintendo started making games for Atari before they ever had their own system. How about them apples? That's right, that's right, in case you didn't know. Mario made his debut on Atari. So that was always funny to me. 
fact that you can play Mario Brothers. And I'm not talking Super Mario Brothers. I'm talking Mario Brothers, where it's Mario. One player plays Mario. One player plays Luigi, and you're in the sewers, and you gotta bounce your head on the ceiling to knock enemies over, and then you can hit into them and shit. Yeah. So, look, Atari was great, and I want to thank. Gregory, and you should all thank Gregory. Make a comment on this video thanking Gregory for commissioning this video because ooh wee, isn't Atari cool? There are some movies that are created that go on to define themselves as their own genre not only do they create their own genre, but they do it so well that no one else can even compete in that genre. So, there's no mistake that the movie Jaws, created by Steven Spielberg, went on to define what it means to be a shark movie. Taking not only shark movies, but cinema as a whole to a whole new level. Now it is the signature of an effective movie and especially a horror movie. If you can create horror and make it scary for a viewer to watch this movie because suddenly you are invading a space where they felt safe. You are, you are violating, you're catching them off guard when they felt safe and secure. And that shot in Jaws where it's under the water, it's from the shark's perspective, and the girls swimming, I mean, there's nothing more iconic. That whole fucking movie is so iconic that it hasn't been taught by any other shark movie. Even the other Jaws movies, especially the other Jaws movies. So it hasn't ever been taught by a Jaws movie. But I mean, hey, there's some other movies some other movies in the shark genre we'll get to that in a minute why not start off by talking about the the crowned king of the shark movie genre i mean steven spielberg all the greatest directors of all time got started out in horror movies steven spielberg what did he get his teeth cut with no pun intended, Jaws. Jaws, y'all, okay? Jaws was one of Steven Spielberg's debut cinematic works. And he knocked it out of the park. He knocked it out of the park. He gave you a horror movie that didn't rely on the dark, didn't rely on jump scares, it didn't rely on gratuitous gore or violence but something that actually terrified audiences because audiences now they 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 can watch this movie and see swimming swimming something swimming out in the water or being out in the ocean being out in the water it's just something that it, it, you know people see it as a safe space something you do with your family you're out there enjoying the water you're not trying to think about the fact that there could be monsters lurking beneath that water and the effective sign of a good horror movie and a good movie in general is if after watching the movie you continue to be scared especially when you enter into the environment of that movie so one of the reasons why Friday the 13th and the Jason movies are so good is because after you watch those movies, once you actually go into that environment, you're out in the woods alone, you know, you're in, the, in a cabin out in the woods, it doesn't matter. Because that movie was so effective, now you're scared in real life, even after the movie is done. And Jaws did that with water. Jaws did that with swimming in the ocean. Right? It turned swimming into the ocean 
from being this beautiful, family-friendly experience into a horrifying, terrifying experience. So that is why Jaws is undeniably the uncrowned king of shark movies. That's why it, it is it is such an, an emblem in our culture. It's in the cultural zeitgeist, the Americana, the global Americana, if you will, because it's so universal. Or maybe it's something that's embedded into the human DNA that to fear sharks, right? So maybe that's why it's so effective. But what other movies? Hey, maybe they're not as effective as Jaws. There was Deep Blue Sea. Oh, man, do you guys remember Deep Blue Sea? What a fucking movie. Now, that's a good shark movie. Right? Samuel L. Jackson. I don't want to spoil any of it, but let me just tell you. People who have seen the movie know what the fuck I'm talking about. Samuel L. Jackson makes his big scene in the movie. It was one of the best scenes in the movie. Um, good fucking flick. They've got the Sharknado movies, the Sharknado movies, where the sharks are flying around in a big water tornado, flying out of the tornado, biting people in half and shit. They made several of those. And, you know, it's just, it's an evolving genre, and I'm sure maybe someday we will get the proverbial remake of Jaws. Everything's got to be remade these days. Nothing's safe. Not even Jaws. And Jaws is the icon. Why would I focus on Jaws when I could talk about all the shark movies in the world? Because Jaws is the icon of shark movies. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Because that's, that's the emblem that people are going to recognize. And, you know, the cool part is maybe, maybe some people will make some new shark movies or some other ones out there, you know, um, there's a lot of top 10 shark movie lists out there. I suggest going out there, seeing if any of them interests you, if you're a Jaws fan. Because there might be a few Jaws-like shark movies out there that you, might get you biting at them. Pun intended. Anyway, what more can I say about shark movies? Give them a chance. If you haven't seen them, at least watch Jaws. At the very least, watch Jaws. It's a must-see movie. And yeah, it just is. It's a classic. It's a classic. Alice in Wonderland. What can I say about Alice in Wonderland? Well, you have no idea. Buckle your safety belts because your minds are about to be blown like a cyclone off into the unknown. That is right, that is right. So what is Alice in Wonderland? We'll start by talking about the author of Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll. What he was doing when he came up with Alice in Wonderland, before he even wrote the book at all, what happened? Believe it or not, the author Lewis Carroll was actually studying at a place called Christ Church, where he almost became a minister. He almost became part of being uh, a part of the church. And so he was studying all of this. And it just so happened that the dean of Christ Church had three daughters. And Lewis Carroll would take the dean's daughters out on little adventures and he would take them on boat rides and one day they went out on this boat ride and the little girls were there and one of the little girls names was Alice and Alice started bothering uh, Lewis Carroll and saying come on tell us a story 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 and she wouldn't be quiet about having him tell them a story. So Lewis Carroll started telling a story that he used the name Alice as the main character of the story as a little jab at the fact that it was Alice who was bothering him so badly to tell a story. 
So right there on the boat, Lewis Carroll unfolded the entire story of Alice. Right there for the three girls. Unbeknownst to him, perhaps. Little did he know, perhaps, or maybe he did. The story he was telling was not coming from his imagination. But at that, Alice in Wonderland is based on a true story, more so than even he knew at the time. So what happened? Well, actually, Lewis Carroll sat there and he told basically everything you know about the Alice in Wonderland story. He, he told it to them on the boat. The girls loved it. And so... One year for Alice's birthday, Lewis Carroll actually sat down and he wrote by hand the first ever edition of Alice in Wonderland. And I believe at that point it was called Alice's Underground Adventure. And he did the illustrations. All the, all the text by hand, and he gave it to her as a gift. And so what happened was she loved the book, and it became a treasured item of hers. And eventually he decided, hey, what the hell? Why not turn this story in this book into something that everyone on the earth can enjoy for the rest of eternity? So that is when he wrote Alice in Wonderland or Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was a huge hit with people all around the world. And at the time, there were no female protagonists in books to the extent there was in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And at that point, there weren't really any children's books at that point. Other than, so it was Alice in Wonderland was kind of a revolutionary, a revolution in literature and children's literature. And so it went on to take the world by storm. All right. So what is cool what is so cool about alice in wonderland of course we've seen disney's interpretation of alice in wonderland and we all love that we all love that movie it's so magical when i say disney's interpretation i'm talking about the original cartoon from disney i'm not talking about the remakes from disney the live action with johnny depp that's another story not going to get into it right now but just just to let you know that original adaptation of Alice in Wonderland is so iconic and so classic and one of the reasons that it resonates so much with people who have watched the movie or read the books is that it is based on a true story and here's where the evanism comes into play this is the true story y'all this is the true story Alice and Alice in Wonderland is actually based on a real person. And I'm not talking about Alice Little, who Lewis Carroll was inspired by when he initially told the story of Alice's adventures underground to the girls on the boat that day. No, I'm not talking about her being the inspiration and the true story behind it. That the actual events in Wonderland itself and Alice because look at Alice Little, she was, she had black hair and she did not have blonde hair or look like how Alice is depicted in the illustrations in the book or in the movies. You know, Alice is always depicted as a blonde haired girl. The moral of the story is Alice is a real person. So who is the real Alice? Alice is princess, one of the princesses of the royal family of the kingdom of heaven. That's right. Alice was born in the kingdom of heaven that 
in case you didn't know, the Kingdom of Heaven exists. Science fact. In giant spaceships deep in outer space. And so Alice was born in the Kingdom of Heaven. And she was basically born a, an immortal god because in the Kingdom of Heaven, human beings merge with technology to achieve immortality and they're able to exist in simulated realities where they can do whatever they want for the rest of eternity and they can make their every dream come true without limitation. So Alice's claim to fame is that her adventures in Wonderland, Alice's adventures in Wonderland did not just happen because Wonderland was some place that just existed before Alice. but. At Wonderland is a place designed around Alice, designed by Alice, that is a place to be shared with all kinds of people. Right? So Wonderland is a simulated reality, okay? because in the Kingdom of Heaven we have Halo technology. And Halo technology is like what you see in the film The Matrix. And so it's a simulated reality that is indistinguishable from real life, all from technology. It's not magic. It's no spiritual mumbo jumbo. It's all technology. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is all science. It's all technology. And so it's just technology that you're not aware of yet. But that's what I'm here trying to do. So anyway, Wonderland exists within Halo technology. An entire realm created by Alice herself on a higher level, right? And so Wonderland is a real place. You go in there, it is a magical place. The second you enter Wonderland, the second you step through the looking glass, you enter Wonderland. It is like you are tripping. It's like you're tripping on magic mushrooms or you're on a psychedelic journey. Everything is moving. Everything is talking. Everything is weird. Everything is wild. The inhabitants are crazy. It is a real place, right? And it is Alice's Wonderland. It is Alice's Wonderland. So, so uh, Wonderland is a real realm. It's a real place. And that is why the movie and the book resonates with people because when people see the movie, and when they he they read the book, it resonates with their soul because they can tell that, hey, there's something about this. There's something about this that rings true. So, Alice in Wonderland is a timeless journey that jumps in and out of the realms of what some would consider fiction and what it's actually based on. Because sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Right? And believe me, the real Wonderland is way stranger than any depiction. All right? So how did Lewis Carroll know about a real place and a real, like, was he... Was he aware of it? Is he a space alien? Was, did he come from heaven? I mean, was he, does he know the story himself? Well, I'll tell you. Regardless of what you think the answers are to that question, in the kingdom of heaven, we have technology known as the divine inspiration machine. Using this technology, we can inspire anyone on planet Earth to have any idea we want them to have. And they will think they're having that idea on their own. They'll think it's coming from their own imagination. They'll be convinced of it. As a matter of fact, that's what the technology does. So we can really put ideas into people's heads. And they don't even know that it, we're doing it. So regardless of who Lewis Carroll really was and what his situation is, that day on that boat, he was divinely inspired with a very true story about a very real place and a very real person. Alice, one of the princesses of the royal family of the kingdom of heaven. So, on that boat, yes, we use technology to make sure that story got out there in the right way. 
right? So that people, through what they thought was fiction, could learn our true story. It is stranger than any other fictional story they've ever heard of. Because believe me, like I said, the real Wonderland is a very, very weird place. But it's cool. If you can hang, if you can hang in Wonderland, you can hang, yo. You can hang out in Wonderland and make repeat visits. Believe me, it's fun. It's fun to go to Wonderland. It's a crazy different dimension. And so the cool part is, you know, this is technology that everybody gets. So look forward to having your own Halo technology where you get to make your own Wonderland. You make the fucking rules. And you can invite anybody over to hang out. Real people, simulated people, it doesn't matter. The sky is not the limit in the kingdom of heaven. And neither is it in Wonderland. So now you know the truth about Alice in Wonderland. Isn't that amazing? Thank you. Thank you, Gregory, for bringing this video into existence. Did I mention you can commission me to make videos? Oh, yeah, get a hold of me. Have your people call my people. We. Oui. So thanks again, Gregory, for commissioning this video today. This has been a lot of fun talking about these three topics. Is there anything in existence that connects these three topics together to the point where it would make any logical sense? Well, perhaps Gregory will send us a picture of the art he's working on. This art, it's not just art, it's a whole project involving art. When it's done, hopefully Gregory will send us a picture of the finished product. And I'll post it right here on YouTube and all over social media so you'll see what this video was all about. And so, I hope this video has inspired you, Gregory, and helped you make this beautiful work of art we're all going to appreciate in the future. I mean, what is it that connects it all? It's what you're doing right now, my friend. And I think it's cool because you know what? Vulcans may disagree, but you can't always do logical shit. Sometimes you have to take Alice in Wonderland, shark movies, and old Atari video games and cram them all into an amazing project. And if this video here was the genesis of the amazing shit you're about to create, Gregory, thank you so much. And if you are interested in commissioning your friend forever, Evan LeFay, to making you a unique video about a topic of your choice, then look, I'm not going to approve every topic. I'm not going to make a video about any topic or every topic or whatever, but you can contact me on Patreon. It's a great place to contact me and you can discuss with me about making a video, right? Because you can commission to make a video. So, ooh, 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 we thank you for watching this video. I am your friend forever, Evan LaFever, and I will see you next time.